You want details? Bye. I drive a Ferrari, 355 Cabriolet. What's up? I have a ridiculous house in the South Fork. I have every toy you can possibly imagine. And best of all, kids, I am liquid. So, now you know what's possible. Let me tell you what's required. Before we get to the life of Vice, no Monday Super Bowl podcast would be complete without a Super Bowl week recap. All right. So, um, as you know, I live out in Manhattan Beach, which isn't really Los Angeles, but it is Los Angeles. And every year, although it still felt like even though it was L.A. and there's a million things to do you know, back in the day that whenever you would go to the Super Bowl and I, the first ones I went to, I think, were 04, 03, 04. And then I went again in 09 with ESPN and I'd gone every year with ESPN until I think the last year I was there when they were like, hey, nobody's going. None of the radio shows are going. And I was like, are you sure about that? And then guess what? A bunch of other radio shows were going. So I was, you know, another little sign there. Things might not be working out. But, um, you know, you go, you get in the weekend before you do your shows, Monday through Friday. ESPN did handle it like first class. Like they wouldn't even want to go to Radio Row. And I used to do Radio Row for the early bosses stuff. But the point is that every night, especially when I was younger, uh, but even a couple of times where I'd, I'd have friends with me or something, you'd be like, okay, what's the game plan? All right, Tuesday night we got this. Wednesday night we got this. Thursday night we got this. Friday night we got this. Saturday night. And then some of the people would stay through Sunday and then try to fly back. And, it, you know, as you got older, you'd go, you know what, I think I'm out of here on Saturday. And then you'd be like, maybe if it's this town, I'm out of here on Friday. But there was always a deal. There was always a big party, probably two, who's getting in. And you'll think like, oh, it must be easy. No, it wasn't always easy for me to get into stuff. Um, certainly, not, not at all. But there'd be a warehouse, and if you had a couple friends with you, even if you could talk your way in, I mean, just the whole thing, you're standing outside, there's somebody with a clipboard, and it's just going on and on. You're texting people on the inside, hey, they're good, this guy isn't good. And after a bunch of years of that, even though it's kind of exciting when you're younger, like, this is fucking boring. Like, it's just, and then you get in, and then you're like, I'm in, and it's 2,000 people, and it's like a free-for-all, and it's not actually that amazing. The parties themselves are not that amazing. So as you get a little bit older, you start to go, hey, let's all go meet up, we're all in town, Let's just meet somewhere and kind of take it from there. And those always ended up being the best night. So this time around, I had one thing that I did on Wednesday in Hollywood, and I did a lap and immediately regretted being there, but I had to be there for a business reason and then met up with a smaller group. And then from that point on, I was like, the only time I'm going to go back into Hollywood would be for this one dinner. And I went to the Wheels Up dinner on Friday night, Rayo's unbelievable wheels up rails do this thing all the time and really the only reason i went is because van pelt speaks at it and we haven't seen each other in forever sanford steve in town same deal um a couple of guys from you know big cat pft came out with us as well but i was like look if you guys want to do a night out just go back to manhattan beach with me it's easy we're not gonna have any issues we can get as many people in as we need to get in anything even if things are packed it's fun trust me and it'll be good to go. And the thing is, is everybody that comes to Manhattan Beach for the first time, they spend a couple of days here, they'll go, okay, I think I kind of get it now. So Friday night after the Rayo's dinner with wheels up, and trust me, there's, there was a bit of a build up to this, but I just want to share with you what, what's one of my favorite observations going out with my man Van Pelt. So we get a car back down to Manhattan Beach. Of course, he's like, how far is this? Are we going to Mexico? I was like, wait, this isn't your first time in L.A. You realize that where I live is not L.A. And, you know, if you want to stay in West Hollywood, none of us wanted to stay there. This, is, this was the move. This was the only move. And there's this kind of social club here that, you know, it sounds a little bit more private than it is. You can kind of get in, but you can't get drinks unless you have an account. And there's only so many members and whatever. Everybody that wants to be, for the most part, it's not like some massive screening thing that you can't get into it. All right. And Van Pelt, for those that don't know, uh, when he goes out, it sucks for him in a way that doesn't suck for other, like other famous people because he's so tall and he's been on Sports Center, this incredibly popular show, and he's great at it. He's been doing it for 20 straight plus years here. And because he's so likable on TV and he's also likable in real life, that there's this almost like you're not intimidated like it's some athlete. You're not intimidated like it's this famous actor or actress. There's like, oh, that's Scott because I feel like I know him. I've been watching you for 20 years, the radio show too, and his personality. So he gets approached in a way where the person has like less reservations around him. And that doesn't always work out. So Steve and I have been around it for a while. 
and we're watching it all kind of play out and we're kind of sitting down and everything's good and people are starting to fuck with him already. And he's like, all right, you know, can I find a seat? And we're like, yeah, we'll go sit in the corner. That's fine. And then there tends to be a, a pattern where some people who are big fans and it's very exciting kind of want to watch you talk to each other. We're like, hey, isn't a fucking live show here. This is I haven't seen Scott in person in a long time. He's here for one night. I haven't Steve, I've seen Steve in person in a really long time. He's here for one night. And Steve stayed with me. You know, this isn't this isn't like, you know, but again, I can kind of understand it's flattering that people would care enough that they want to sit around you and listen. And I'll admit too, um, you know, being younger and you can't really get it unless you're on the other side of it. I may see somebody and I'd have a few drinks in me because you'd want a few drinks in you to kind of break down those, you know, that's why people drink a lot. It's going to break down the inhibitions about going to approach somebody else. But you only kind of get like this one window, right? You get this one window to prove you're not a raging dickhead. And that window lasts about 15 to 30 seconds. And I failed the test myself, okay? But now I kind of understand the test a little bit more because I've not only seen it in the rare occasions with me, but with people with a much bigger profile. And so <laughs> there's this one guy. He walks up to Van Pelt as we're sitting there. We're talking to each other. And he had his line ready, man. He was ready to make a joke and everybody's going to crack up and he was going to get invited to hang out with the buddies. And we're all going to have a great time talking college football. Who knows? Who knows what we would have talked about? But he failed those 15 or 30 seconds. He failed them. And he just goes up to Van Pelt. And the other thing Van Pelt hates is when you touch him. Don't touch the animals. Okay? This guy whacks him in the shoulder so hard. Like kind of like a like backhand slap into his shoulder. He's like, hey, SVP, when are you going to start buying some fucking beers? We were like, oh, and Scott's face, like, what the, like, who, what? And then Stanford Steve jumps up to the rescue, and Steve just goes, hey, you. And he, like, swings his finger across, <laughs> and it's so scary when Steve actually does get mad. Steve's like, he has you. bouncer vibes. What? He does. Yeah. No, Stanford has major, major bouncer vibes. And then we found, like, another area over there. And then there may or may not have been a, a guy who I know from, from a couple business transactions just started screaming out interest rates to us. And then Van Pelt just looks at me and goes, there's seven people in here right now that could be deemed the drunkest person in any town. And they're all here at the same time. He's like, what the fuck is this place? And I go, I don't know. It's a lot of older successful people that want to have a good time. And this happens to be a very small slice of that in one room. Now he had a blast, sort of, I think his standards and then everybody said their goodbyes but watching this person who thought he was absolutely going to nail it and see him he didn't just fail he like it, i can't say i can't say he didn't even show up to take the test because he did attempt to whatever it was in that short amount of time but to just see it all go down and then you know the rest of us kind of put our head in our hands going oh my god like what is this guy doing and he picked the wrong, he picked the absolute worst person to do this to. And he thought he was so funny. And he wasn't. The next time we get Van Pelt on, I want to ask him, in that situation, is there anything that some random can say to him that's, that's going to make him want to strike up a conversation? Because I think the answer, I think there's nothing that's, like, this goes back to the, like, the life advice from a couple months ago, the guy trying to befriend Carmel Anthony. There's just nothing you can say. Like, you can, you can rehearse a line in your head. You could have the best line planned out. You could have the funniest thing ever. And I don't think anything in that scenario, Van Pelt was going to take the bait on it. I'm not the right person to ask. Cause I would, I would think I could probably think of a couple, but I've also known him for a really long time. Um, you know, your best bet would be, you know, I don't think the gap between Duke and Maryland is that big. That might be the only. <laughs> See, one. I was thinking that, but that's, it's too simple. It's like, all right, yeah, buddy, I don't know. Then again, yeah. he does argue with random people on Twitter, so maybe he wouldn't entertain that conversation. Well, he, um, he might be, he might be excited. He might want to actually have that conversation. You go, you know, maybe you're not, maybe you're right. Maybe that is a possibility. Uh, and then it just, it was, it was sort of chaotic there for a little while. It got a little chaotic. And then some younger guys were trying to buy us shots nonstop. And it was like, no, nobody wants those, man. Like, you're just going to get to a certain age. You're going to understand, like, you'll remember this conversation that we're having with you right now, 15 years from now, like you, you can't understand it right now. 
And the thing is, is when I was in my 20s, look, I failed the test a few times. I still remember this one time with a football player. I was like 26 and I wanted to make it work. And I, you know, I drank too much and I was fucking annoying. <laughs> I just, I just was. <laughs> what did you say? What did you do? I was just like, no, no, you. And then I was trying to compare him to this other guy. And he was like, yeah, dude, I got it. I got it. And then he wasn't really drinking. And then there was a couple of his other friends around that knew me. And then he was just like. I was like, no, 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 no. And then he's like, dude, I got it. I got it. And I just, I kind of looked back on it. I didn't even realize it was that bad until now I look back on it. Well, I knew fairly soon, you know, years removed from it. But I was like, yeah, you just, you didn't hear that one great. Um, you know, I can even see there's times where if I'm going to something like where I'll go, oh, I know this guy or I've had him on a couple of times. Like I have an opening. But as you get older, you just go like, he probably didn't want to talk to me. So why even push he's it? got his and, crew yeah you got yeah, your crew yeah yeah so why like oh cool now we're gonna be friends and summer together no nah, we're not gonna do that so kyle we really could have used you because then it got a little aggressive but stanford steve shuts it all down pretty quickly it could it, he just he kind of has this look you're right very very good call did, surety on the bouncer vibes did stanford steve make it the frolic room kyle that was the rumor going around buddy i don't know uh i I forgot to ask, but I told the bartender, Troy, when he got there, I was like, is there any way I, his first beer could be on me? I don't care if it's like uh, 1942 or or if it's uh, Pappy or whatever. If Is there any way his first order could be on me? He said he's coming right from the airport. I felt like maybe that was just posturing. I don't think he did it. Hmm. No, he was at my house right from the airport. So yeah. um, there may have been an incident with another guest who was thrown out of showbacks late. Ooh. Not for anything. Well, he lit a cigarette inside, frowned upon. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes been, you forget where you are. Respect Pat. it. Yeah. There are laws <laughs> yeah. that have been passed in a lot of states. Sometimes the only thing you want to do is just, just start. So. Right. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't hostile. And it was very like, hey, what are you doing? And the guy was like, oh, yeah, sorry. And then I was kind of trying to clean up, clean up the mess a little bit. There may have been somebody who left a person of the year award at a dive bar as well i have to wow. go fix i have to go fix that one up for somebody else uh at some point this week so i don't know if you guys have any more follow-ups we can just get the life advice well the irony i think for you is that you have great self-awareness and i remember from the times that we've traveled like i remember the time at wando's when like a couple dudes were coming up and you know with you it's usually one question like all right one question like a quick conversation then kind of move on and as soon as like that person doesn't move on you don't have the patience to be like to entertain the conversation you're just out and then there are a couple of times where I'll like dip in and I'll start talking to the guy and then trying to get him away from you. But some dudes are just persistent, man. If you've had a couple of drinks and you're like there five minutes just doing all the talking to a semi-famous person or famous person, you got to you gotta have the awareness to just walk away. Right, but I'm, I'm telling you I have screwed it up. So I have some sympathy for when it's happening. And with me, it's just if I'm with somebody, I don't hang out with many people. So if I am with somebody and I'm out, it's probably the person that I want to hang out with. And it's rarely going to be a situation with with a dude where you're going like now we're you introduce yourself you like the show now we're going to hang out for three hours like that's that's tough to pull off i couldn't pull that off with somebody is there an example when you did nail it and you ended up like befriending some famous dude is it was it chris long uh no, no. <laughs> you know what the Vince vaughn one at, at at a wedding i was at it went pretty well, but I'd already interviewed him a couple of times. So I wasn't coming out of nowhere. He knew, so and he knew you, he didn't, he knew who I was. Random. Okay. Right. But he wasn't like totally, Oh, this is, you know, this is a guy I want to hang out with. And the thing is, is I actually kind of fucked it up for him. I fucked it up for him because we were at the Drake hotel. It was a big fancy wedding and it was a massive, like it was the kind of like a socialite wedding. And there was a sidebar away from the main, you know, reception room i guess and i went off like the uvm guys classic like hey let's just go off to the sidebar and goon out for an hour while all of our wives and dates get pissed at us and then as i was over there i was like oh shit that's vince vaughn and you know it was him his, his wife and uh another couple and i was like oh whatever i've interviewed a couple times let's just go say hi and we actually started talking college football and it was like a sincere conversation but then because i did that then a bunch of Randos. the wedding party started coming over and i it's open season on vince that's a bummer right yeah. and then his wife did look at me because they got up and left like i ruined it they were in a uh, private area ouch and then the wife looked at me like hey asshole cool Damn. you guys you and vince got to talk about college football and we had a private area and we were good to go and no one was going to come up to us and then they thought it was and i was kind of like well look you're right but i didn't tell everybody else to come over here 
And then she's kind of like, yeah, right. Yeah, like I'm new here. <laughs> By the way, this sidebar was happening, Vince or no Vince, lady. <laughs> so <laughs> we were going to be at this bar anyway. But yeah, we were already here. We were here for the wedding. <laughs> Sorry, Vince or no Vince, the sidebar was happening for us. So <laughs> for this group. Moral of the story is though, Van Pell had a good time. He got out of the house. He enjoyed, he, he didn't stay in his hotel room. He had a good time. Correct. There can there can be arguments that during the oh. time he wasn't having a blast. All right. He just couldn't believe certain things he would see. Like there was one point where this guy just kept yelling out rates and he kept looking at me, people like, what is he? Is he quoting the yield, the 10 year? Like, what is this guy talking about? I was like, ah, don't worry about it. No worries, it's fine. And then he'd be like, What's going on with her? He's like, Do you know her? I'm like, yeah, actually, yeah, that's you know, whatever, so and so. He would just be like, what's going on with her? I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't really talk to her. And he was in amazement. He was like, this place is really amazing. Like, I love this place, but I can't believe what is going on. So whatever. Life advice is life advice rr at gmail. We have a follow-up to the guy that wrote in about his cycling instructor flirting with him, and he didn't know how to handle it. I don't think we have any follow-ups from him. Well, Kyle, double-check that. So... This guy has a take on it, or I should say a spin nice. on uh, Great. on what went down in that email. He goes, hey, guys, just listen to the pod and the situation of the female instructor, quote, flirting with our buddy who wrote in. I thought I'd write in as I'm a spin instructor who's been teaching for around five years, and none of what he said in that email was flirting from the spin instructor. <laughs> oh. Wow. Wow. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm in. A dart between the eyes right there. <laughs> Don't want to take anything away from him. <laughs> Bad job, if that was your goal. But honestly, as an instructor, we are literally told to do all of those things to clients in and after class. Uh-oh. For example, if someone told me they love Taylor Swift, guy or girl, and I played it in class, I would 100% every time call that person out by name. This is not flirting. This is the instructor trying to make an experience for someone. Oftentimes, a client will mention they love Drake or some artist, and I'll message them prior to class to ask them what their favorite song is. This isn't flirting. I just know it will all make their class more enjoyable. I'm sure Sarudi has heard this on Peloton when they call out the person's account handles. Sarudi. It's true. It's true, but they don't do it. Yeah, it's not the same, but yeah. Also, staring at someone and calling their name in class may be the furthest thing from flirting. Mm -hmm. And I think confirms to me that you're fine here. We were told to call out people's names in class. I often memorize the names of the clients before class and try to call them out periodically. I don't do this for any particular clients, just those names are easy to remember or I recognize. Also, I'm sorry, but you're likely also the token guy in the class. I always have maybe two or three guys in every class, and they are the easiest to call out. Lastly, coming up to someone after class and asking about their weekend is not a move. What else are you supposed to do to ask someone after class? It's honestly the only talking point you have other than how did you like the class? Also, we often try and get drinks or coffee with students after class. It's part of the job to build your base. <laughs> By the way, I, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking about the 20 women that think this guy ha has a thing for them. They're like, oh, yeah, my God. like he takes me out to coffee. You have to be a cyclist <laughs> and an escort. That's the only way it works. It's the only way you're successful in this business. Is this guy just <laughs> gaslighting all the women in his class. Hey, yeah. Bang. Twice in a row. <laughs> now that we know what the word means. <laughs> we're, I'm hitting you with one fly. on Wednesday. I'm hitting well you done. with the gaslighting on Wednesday. <laughs> well, sorry to my guy here for being harsh above. Maybe this instructor really is into him and is going too far. Who knows? Last thing I'll say here is that every guy that goes to spin class or fitness class thinks the hot instructor is trying to hit on them. And this is purposeful. We are actually taught to do this exactly. Uh-oh. What is going on with this industry? And also do things like engage with clients after class and try to build community. I agree with Kyle on this one and try to just to go with it and try to enjoy it. What was it? Take it for the dudes, take it for the dudes. <laughs> <laughs> and by no means bring your girlfriend to class if you want to come back. That being said, if you did bring her, the instructor would be nothing but friendly to your girlfriend after class because the instructor is not hitting on you. She's just trying to get a loyal client. I heard some grunts and groans in the background from Kyle on this one. So I'll, I'll let you take the lead. I mean, all I was going to say is that's crazy. That's crazy. Like, like we're trained. It's like, you sound like you're like a bottle girl or something. And that's, cr that's kind of crazy. Doesn't it? it's like, you know, we don't get the tips unless we, you know, unless we come pretty close to them at the bar, you know, it's just, it just sounds like the, oh, there's a lot of psychological stuff that beyond just like pushing you to be your best, like <laughs> involved here. It's like, we got to ask about their weekend and uh, we got to point and stare 
and uh, and learn the names, but only the ones who are there's just they're all over the place. And I just I don't believe you. <laughs> it sounds like you work at the uh, the craziest cycle spot around, although I've never been to one. So I could be way off base. I just think I don't think if we pulled like nine out of 10 dentists wouldn't agree with what you're saying is all i'm saying <laughs> nine out of ten though i you think five I, out of ten dentists i don't know i don't know it's always nine out of ten like there's always one person that couldn't get on board and she seems like the one i don't i don't think i don't right. think she's the nine the guy going <laughs> that's ah, all crest, i'm saying crest is all right <laughs> we're a colgate household over here by the way yeah all right so rudy i just now i kind of want he made some good points. I, like I, I, th those are all accurate things. They call people out. I'm sure they want to get people engaged. They want to get people calling back. I would just like to give our original uh, email or the benefit of the doubt that he knows the difference between what's happening, like tactics and her actually hitting on him. And yeah, all right. Maybe he's the only guy in the class and she's doing that to him to point him out or whatever. And it's not actually like a thing that she's into him. But I like to think that he'd have the common sense and the knowledge to know that this is a little bit weird. So I think the only explanation now is I think his, I think his, his girlfriend's wife I want to. I want her to go to the class. I uh, want her to go to the class. Yeah. I want her to see what happens. That's how we find out what the. You know. That's how we get to the bottom. We, of this. we can't call this life advice if you want his girlfriend to go to the class. Well, now we can't I want call this answer, life advice so anymore. I'm interested in the actual answer to this, so I think that's the only solution we have. He's got to take this one. Can't for the be. Beats. <laughs> no. This yeah. Can't be life advice. <laughs> no. This is like home records. Is what this is. He has to do it for all of us. Everyone that do it for the dudes. The we need an answer. Yep. And the female audience. Let's not forget that too. I think the. Guy wrote a bunch, just like you said, Srudy. I think there are a lot of good points in here. And I also love the bottle service call out deal because the bottle service girl usually isn't that into you unless you're the main attraction um, in the group of dudes and, and something that really brings the dudes to the table. Or if you're maybe in a smaller market, you know, a AAA market. And then the move with the bottle service girl <laughs> is that you're paying and you shit on every one of your buddies that screws up <laughs> to her. That works sometimes. So just that's that's just life advice. That's just extra. That's just on top, free toppings. Um, I think this guy brings up a ton of good points, but we don't know. We don't know because I would think if I were the previous guy and all these things were happening, I go all right, fine. So you know what? I think he, this guy brought a lot of good information to the table, but I think it's still. I don't think we have a conclusion on this. I don't think he's wrong, but yeah. I think he's he really seems dedicated to his job and is probably very good at it i don't know that this applies to, to our original email or i don't know that we don't know and just you saying it's not that he's wrong is probably infuriating to him because it is his industry and he's explaining <laughs> he's like idiots i just wrote you an email about what exactly the job we is gave and you credit guy we said right. we said you brought up some good points you it know? sounds like a unique cycle <laughs> house is all i'm saying it sounds like a, he, told, he brought up his specific trainings like and they tell us they tell us to touch them. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, <laughs> like we are we are told try to make out a ton <laughs> with clients, but it's just building your base. It's not a big deal. <laughs> there are there are a handful of guys right now listening to this whole thing go down that are like, wait, is my instructor not into me? Like, <laughs> what, what's up with We're this? We're gonna guy have a lot of dudes signing up for. for I just re up for six months. God damn it! I know today was supposed to be a cardio day. I might put it to the test. <laughs> see what happens just dying five minutes in all right uh hey ryan big fan listening to you since nba today those are the real the only people wow. that are pre nba today ogs are the guys that'll say i don't think i've ever had anybody go loved you on the trenton thunder games <laughs> boston we'll get a couple of those right now all right five nine two ten get back to the gym recently cut down early 30s married couple small kids during the pandemic changed jobs moved my family across the country i'm in a business to business sales role with a relatively well-known company in the south uh, i can't bring myself to say y'all yet well, you'll get there just tweet about the halftime show the super bowl be like y'all crazy <laughs> if you don't love this one Y'all creeped uh, up into the Northeast. It's everywhere. It doesn't. It's everywhere. That's what I mean. Anymore. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not even a cultural thing anymore. It's just people on social media. By the way, it's halftime show. I thought Kendrick Lamar was the highlight of it. I thought Fifty Cent was not the highlight. Was that cool? Shot at Kyle. That's fine. Right. You're entitled to your opinions. Yep. Uh, all right. So our man comes into the sales job with a comp plan that included thirty thousand base salary with unlimited earnings cap, but my expected range was sixty to eighty k annually. I started out earning. My first year and was on track to make 115000 At this point, our comp plan changed with some reasons for my bosses about fairness to other sales teams. And some of my team uh, set to make more than executive leaders. It also went from being a mildly complex comp plan to very straightforward and predictable. However, this ended up cutting my paychecks basically in half 
to the expected original rate, even though I'm still killing it month to month. I talked to my boss and his boss expressed concerns. Uh, I talked to my boss and his boss and expressed concerns politically talking about team morale, BS, et cetera. They said they'd like to take it into consideration and get back to me. It's been a few months, no word on any changes. I like the company and my team, but the principle of the whole thing eats at me daily. I get it. Comp changes happen everywhere. Should I keep sticking it out to see if anything changes or take a risk on a new company with potentially the same issues? Love the show. Looking forward to your thoughts. All right. So uh, my understanding here is that you thought you were making 115 k They make the comp changes compensation again, if anybody's struggling with that. Uh, they make those changes while you're in this cycle. And so basically you made half of what you thought you were going to make. And so this changes the whole projection of why you thought you were going to work there. Um, the scary thing is they may have known this before and you took the job. So that part sucks. This would eat at me all the time. We had an agreement as far as what I was going to get paid. And now I'm not getting paid this and I'm just supposed to be cool with it. But then, as you said, you like everything else apparently about this. Um, if you're this good, then you can get another job. And the fact that they said, let's give it a few months and they didn't say anything to you, that was kind of a corporate fuck off. That's really what it was. So that's going to bother you even more. So some people are okay with it. Some go, hey, you know what? Everything changed. That kind of sucks. You know what? I'm just going to deal with it because I like the job. Find out if there's another job because if it's eating at you enough to write an email, it's probably only going to get worse. And then you're going to start thinking of things retroactively about like, oh, they fucked me on this one and all oh, this happened and oh, here we go again. I mean, honestly, I'm sorry, but I do it too often where then I start adding up all the things where I go, wait a minute, wait a minute, this happened, that happened. So I would, uh, I would look to move on, but I would make sure you have a good option instead of just, you know, fucking Michael Scott quitting and then realizing like, Oh, actually I don't want to do that because I didn't have any kind of backup plan whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, I would say no, like this, this is one of those cases where I think it's totally, they can't stop you from looking for a job while you're still working at this one. And so that's all all of the the stuff that makes you stick to your stomach when you think about how this all went down. You could just maybe that could take the edge off of you, some of your energy to find a new job, because if it was like some sort of like you were passed up for a promotion thing or you were, you know, your vacation days didn't work out or something happened where it's like anything that isn't literally like messing with your entire paycheck, like everything else, I think you could sort of compartmentalize and try to move on from. But yeah, this seems like you should probably be spending your time trying to see what else is out there. And if it turns out that, you know, what everybody's doing now in your line of work is this sort of uh, model, then maybe you stay. But I mean, you're, you're, you're never going to like be okay with this until you find out if that's the truth. So yeah, I totally would agree with you putting a lot of time into seeing what else is out there. Was he firm enough with like the with his employers though? Was he, you know, should he be like, hey, he obviously brought up the complaint and said, I'm not like super pumped about this. Time has gone by, they haven't said anything. Should he follow up and say, Hey guys, I'm just looking for an update? Like, I don't know if this is gonna work for me long term. Like, kind of like push it along a little bit, make it known that you're unhappy, make it known that you could you know potentially leave. And maybe they'll be like, Well, shit, we can't lose this guy. Like, he's really good. Maybe we'll give him a bump, maybe they'll give us emergency. I think that would work. And I think Kyle's advice as well, always be looking to for something else. That's just a yeah. general life thing. Be motivated about it, you know? Go, okay, you're going to do this. And then, I mean, you could, I don't know. I mean, you know, the weird thing is if you're really that good at it and then you do get something solid somewhere else, they may say, all right, well, we'll, we'll change the compensation around. But just as a wait it out, go, hey, we'll give you, I mean, they, they, they gave you a fuck you. They did. Yeah, you got to oh, follow we'll, up. We'll give it a few months. They're not motivated to resolve this or talk about it as you are. So the longer you ignore it, they're happy about it. I mean, yeah, they're hoping you're more comfortable yeah. enough to be like, all right, fine. Or you're just not confrontational. And then you're just going to go, well, uh, you know, well, they can, I'm still waiting. You know, some people be like, oh, it's been a year. And they haven't got back to me, but I could maybe at some point, you know, meanwhile, you're making half of what you thought you were going to make based on the email. All right. Another one. This one's specific. It's complicated and it's uh, a little different. I love it. Hey, guys, six foot. 180, 315 squat, 295 deadlift, 155 bench, long arms. They're also not that strong. Sorry. <laughs> it's not just long arms. No, I mean. Emailing in from Canada where I work at a fitness and recreation center with a bunch of basketball courts. Huh. Three weeks ago, I lost one of my sneakers. I don't know how I lost it. But I went to the gym bag. And one day, it was, one of my Kobe's was gone. Oh, man. I was devastated. I kept checking the lost and found at work that we keep in the back room, but the show, uh, the shoe never showed up. But 
have about a week of checking a sick pair of LeBrons that looked barely worn appeared in one of the lost and found bins. Naturally, I had to see if they were my size, which they were. I left them alone, though. I had just lost the sneaker, and I knew the pain and suffering it caused. I wanted the rightful owner of the shoes to have a chance to get them back. They've now been there for two weeks. I check in on them frequently to see if anyone has picked them up. But they're still there. Yesterday, I tried them on for the first time. They fit like a fucking glove. <laughs> you did a great job reading this, dude. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't want the guy to be totally anti-me after the bench thing, but this is a really good email. I'm tired of popping into the back room to lust over shoes. My question is twofold. Firstly, is it weird to take someone else's shoes from the lost and found? In my mind, it's no weirder than buying shoes from a thrift store. Obviously, I will clean and wash them before wearing them, but is it still weird? Secondly, have I waited the requisite time period before taking these shoes? I feel like I've given the owner ample time to claim them. And at this point, he's probably just charged it to the game and moved on. I don't want to wait so long that one of my other coworkers will just swoop in and take them. Please help me as playing pickup hoops in my old Nike runners sucks. This is a real dilemma. All right, let me start by saying this. As somebody who's had his car broken into a million times, had shit stolen from him, had a nice watch stolen from him, had credit cards, debit cards, that whole shit. Like, it just sucks that there's so many people out there that would take other people's stuff, and they're just okay with it. That's not what this is, but it's leaning towards it, all right? My answer today was very different from my answer in my 20s. Not that I was just out fucking taking everybody's stuff, but my priorities were different, and I'm probably more sympathetic to things than I would have been when I was younger. So I get it. You lost your shoe. Here are these other shoes. You want to take them. You probably took them already. You're just writing the email this way. I thought about a solution to this one. Even though I think there's more of the audience is like, just fucking take them, dude. They've been in lost and found two weeks. You like them. They're nice LeBrons. And the other thing is somebody else from work is going to take them. So that's some of those weird things you start doing where you're justifying it, where it's like, I'm not totally clean in this, but somebody else is going to take them. So why don't I be the guy that goes ahead and takes them? What I would do, because I know you're going to take them. Well, let me put it this way. I wouldn't take them. I'd leave them there. Go ahead. Whatever. If somebody else wants to take them. That's fine. But if you want to try to give yourself some moral out, you take them now, put them in a bag, and you wait another two weeks. So that way, if the person is like, hey, I lost the shoes. I had no idea where I lost them. I finally realized after three weeks that this is where they were. Or, hey, something happened and I had to travel or something at home happened. Because you're going to feel like shit if you kept them, kept them. And then you go to the guy and you pull them aside and go, hey, here's the deal. Somebody was going to take them. And it was going to be me. But I put them in a bag and I put them aside and did nothing with them until another couple of weeks went past. And now you're still inside that window. Because then if it's a lost and found, you're coming back four months later for your sneakers. That At that point, like you get it, like you said, you charge it to the game on that one. I feel like Kyle's going to have a slightly different take on this, perhaps a bit more aggressive. But that's what I would at least do. Some of those mental gymnastics to make yourself feel a little bit better about taking a guy's used basketball shoes, which you've clearly justified used part in your own head. You're processing these things that leads to what I already know is you taking these shoes. Yeah, what I would say is you came to the absolute right place. I don't know which way Saruti's leaning on this. Ryan's leaning in my direction, and I'm just going a little bit further. That's all. So you came to the right place. You get, you're getting what you want, unless Saruti completely does a 180 on this, which I don't know. Maybe he would. I was going to say two weeks. I mean, if you're a good person, if you're the version of me I was 10 years ago, two weeks wasn't happening. But now and even a couple would years two ago. two minutes happen? <laughs> I mean, I might, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll clock out. I think we're clocking out. And if it's still there, it, yeah. might, <laughs> it might be game time. I don't know. Um, but, you know, even as, as recent as a couple years ago, I would be like, all right, two weeks is the minimum. That's what you know. You know, two weeks is what happens. Um, so I, I, and now I would wait a little longer than two weeks because that's the bare minimum. And you're clearly, you know, you clearly have a conscience and you clearly, um, uh, are are worried about this so yeah i would i think i think your thing is actually right it's like yeah put them put them to the side if you're really not sure what kind of characters you work with or maybe you are sure what kind of characters you work with 
then yeah, maybe maybe put him in a bag somewhere uh, off to the side, and then you can and then you can feel fine. I think a month. I mean, come on, I've been boned by the lost and found so many times as well, and you know, I even I even in freshman year I left something in my locker the day after that was supposed to be cleaned out. Leather jacket. My mother never let me forget it, and it was just it made it all the way into the the janitor's custodial lost and found. I went there the next day. She dragged me there. Went there. Wasn't there. It's just the lost and found. It's a. It's a. It's really a toss up. You can't expect anything for the lost and found. So um, I'd say if you wait a month, even if you do it in your little way that nobody else who doesn't deserve them doesn't get them, I think that's totally fine. So I was gonna say I was gonna say wait a week, but I think yeah, wait two weeks. We'll put them in the bag so that you know nobody else gets them in an ill-gotten manner. Only you. So you're saying the two weeks after the initial two weeks, like what I, I said. I think two weeks is a bare minimum. Yeah, I think two weeks is a bare. I was going right, to say we're at two week. weeks. We're at two weeks now. We're at two and weeks. I was saying you could take them off to the side because really this isn't even about the original owner. Right now this is going who is going to break down morally first who I work with. <laughs> yeah, what kind of man <laughs> That's are you? Really, this is what the competition is. It's not with the original <laughs> owner. It's with everybody else you work with. Yes. So that's how you can start to selfishly process these things. You know, it's. Like we all kind of do like I, today I wouldn't take them. I just I just wouldn't. I would hope the guy would come back. But, you know, they're not going to last if they're nice LeBrons anyway. So I'm surprised they were there this long. Wait, was the guy was he in Canada? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, the shit. It, it's it's a decision that he's already made and he wants validation on. Uh, I'm not a big LeBron fan shoe fan so like i wouldn't take oh, them boy. personally if they were a different shoe that's it's, it's a different story i would probably take Kobe's. <laughs> no it is relevant um but if you like the lebrons and you know depending on what kind of lebrons are they could be pretty expensive my biggest concern though would be like if you if you because how is this guy gonna reach you and be like hey i lost my shoes like and you have them in a bag i've been holding your feet like my biggest concern is like after a month if you put them on right you start wearing them in pickup games and he goes hey those are my shoes dude like what do you say at that point you just say hey you know, I, he's like, I, they weren't in lost and found. And I checked two weeks ago, like maybe he'll check tomorrow and they're not there. And then a month later, you're wearing his shoes. I, I don't I don't know. That would be I don't know. I wouldn't have a good answer for that. I think that'd be kind of a problem for you. But man, what what could happen in those two weeks? Like, why would this guy not have picked up his his LeBron's? I don't know. So I, I just I just laid out a bunch of make believe examples of what could have possibly happened. <sighs> but Rudy picks up a really good point, because if the guy who works at the facility also like is running full court all the time. And then a month from now, the guy's like, hey, did you find those here? And now you have to lie. And if there's a chance he saw you bench pressing, he's probably not afraid of you. Like, who knows? Yeah, my my one of my best friends lives in used to live in Medford, Mass, just outside Boston. And he ordered a pair of shoes to his door and they were getting a bunch of stuff stolen from their from their porch. And his shoes got stolen. He calls like the postal service and like, no, we dropped them off. Here's the picture. And they just weren't there. A couple of days later, he sees his neighbor wearing the shoes he ordered. And he confronted him about it. And he was like, nah, like they're not my shoes. So you could just play that route and go, I don't know. I had these, I had these, these are my shoes. I don't know what you want me to say, dude, unless there's like a marking on them that, that would like, you know, make them unique or something. But that would just be my biggest concern is this guy comes back and goes, why the hell did you steal my shoes? Then you're kind of in a weird spot where you're like, yeah, I took them out of the lost and found. And it's kind of a dick move, sketchy move. But like, I, you know, somebody stole my shoe, like, you know, a month or so ago. I don't know. It sounds like this guy lost his own shoe. Yeah. That's a really good point though, because that <laughs> conversation could happen and, uh, you know, the chances are reading his email, the guy's sitting there listening to the podcast and a pair of slightly used LeBron. He's, so. Yeah, he's lacing those up. <laughs> he's, he's putting new laces in here. <laughs> okay, that's life advice. Life advice rr at gmail.com. Thank you to Kyle and Steve for all of their help on the Ryan Russillo podcast. Please subscribe, Ringer, and Spotify. We'll talk to you Wednesday with Mark Wahlberg.